It is my pleasure to um, present to you today on behalf of Bausch & Lohm, the Boston Custom Lab Channel Division, uh, our presentation, the Graph Challenge, which is contact lens management for corneal transplants. My name is Lynette Johns and I'm the moderator of today's pre presentation. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Bruce Koffler, who's a cornea specialist, Dr. Renee Reeder, who's an optometrist and very skilled contact lens fitter, and Dr. Jill Beyer, who's also an optometrist and an extremely skilled contact lens fitter as well. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Bruce Koffler. Dr. Koffler is the founder and medical director of the Koffler Vision Group and associate clinical professor of ophthalmology at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Koffler serves on several boards, including CLEO, the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and the International Medical Contact Lens Council. He has presented numerous ophthalmic research papers for organizations, including the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the Association of Research and Vision in Ophthalmology, the Contact Lens Association of Ophthalmologists, the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, and the International Congress of Ophthalmology. Dr. Koffler's scientific papers have appeared in major professional journals. Dr. Koffler is past president of the Kentucky Academy of Ophthalmology and the Lexington Academy of Ophthalmology. Dr. Koffler received his medical degree from the Georgetown University School of Medicine, where he completed his training in cornea and external disease. With that, I'm going to have Dr. Koffler start with his first case. Lynette, thank you so very much for the kind introduction and for your time and effort in putting this together. Uh, I also would like to just start out and recognize uh, Dr. Jessica Besner, who is a optometrist an associate of my office who has helped me to put together and update uh, these slides for you tonight. What I'd like to kind of just talk a little bit about is the surgeon's view of contact lenses in relationship to corneal transplantation. And one of the things that we see very often is this picture here where the contact lens is uh, apparently looks pretty good when you look at it straight on with the slit lamp. But I have to tell you that you must lift up the upper lid on these contact lenses because they tend to kind of ride superiorly and dig in. And here's a lens that's digging in. It's producing neovascularization up towards the limbus. And if we have the next slide, you can see another case. And here you can see the uh, obvious ischemia right past the neovascularization and then the neovascularization riding onto the cornea of a lens that's riding superiorly and is too tight. Next case. And then what happens when this goes on unchecked is that you have these nice healthy feeder blood vessels that go into the cornea just ready to produce some form of graft rejection. So uh, the ultimate complication we want to avoid. Corneal uh, tericity or astigmatism is the major uh, visual outcome in corneal transplantation that we don't really particularly like. We have regular versus irregular astigmatism and most likely irregular astigmatism on these graphs. The incidence of high astigmatism, greater than five diopters, really is pretty common. And many studies will show it between 10 and 27 percent. It tends to be rather higher in corneal transplantation for characteristics. The causes of high astigmatism, well, we could take preoperative causes like corneal thinning, neovascularization, and the astigmatism pre-op that we see in keratoconus that's difficult for us to manage. And then the operative uh, situation is that we always put on a fluoringa ring onto the sclera and we suture that on to give us upward support of the globe so that we don't have collapse of the globe while we're doing a 360 degree trephination or opening. The type of tree finds that we use, the configuration and centration of the tree fine opening, this may seem to be rather simple, but getting a nice central trephination of a cornea uh, can often be uh, not so simple and, and, and difficult. Alignment of the donor to the recipient bed, particularly in suturing of all this, the graft versus host disparity. I tend to like a quarter diopter difference, like an 8.25 on an 8.0 millimeter base, but other surgeons will do different. They'll have up to a 0.5 millimeter disparity. And finally, the length depth and configurations of the sutures are all very important. 
When we look at a graph uh, with the keratometer, which we all have in our offices, you're, you're looking for irregular astigmatism and the amount of it. And here's the classical case of horizontal on the left and vertical on the right, where you just can't get the Myers to line up. Next. So keratometry is kind of the initial place to start. It'll give you some idea of just how irregular the, uh, the astigmatism is. But the keratometer assumes a spherocylindrical shape. It's based on the three millimeter ring. Uh, it will show us distorted Myers at this ring. And the concept of the keratometer is really based on two hemimeridians that is symmetric around the apex of the cornea, separated by 180 degrees, and that the steep meridian is 90 degrees away from the flat meridian. Well, the challenge with graphs is they really don't follow this line of thinking, and uh, the hemiridians are not 90 degrees away from each other. The other thing I might mention is that remember that ophthalmic MDs tend to work in plus cylinder in our offices while as the ODs tend to work in minus cylinder for all the contact lens work that you do. So in this presentation, I'll be doing a lot of plus cylinder discussion because that's just the way I think. Next. From the uh, keratometer, we went to placido disc imaging and the corneoscope. This is a lighted placido disc uh, instrumentation that goes up to about anywhere between eight and 16 rings. Next. And we can interpret um, the the rings, and here is a nice spherical cornea, normal cornea, unoperated, that has a beautiful symmetry. Next, now compare this to this particular picture where you've got the ovalization of the rings. The steep axis, remember, is at the short end of the uh, oval, and this would be at 120 degrees, uh, roughly, on this picture. Next slide. This matches up beautifully to corneal topography imaging. And we were lucky to develop the corneal topographer in at about 1990 or so. Uh, I was fortunate to have one of the early topographers. Next slide. And you can see that here. Um, and we were fortunate to utilize this with a lot of early studies. Next slide. And the corneal modeling system allowed us to visualize asymmetry and axis and power. Curvatures could be attained at any corneal point. You could take the cursor and move it to any point on the cornea and it would tell you what power and, and uh, uh, axis that you were at. You can also look at the um, numbers in absolute, normalized, or spread out the rings into isometric scales. You looked at the entire corneal surface. It was very reproducible and very easy to read. Next slide. What I loved about corneal topography is the ability to, to show it to the patient and they can kind of visualize what you were talking about because astigmatism is a very difficult concept to present to the, to the patient. And here you can see a very nice kind of uh, regular uh, uh, Myers on a corneal transplant. And I must say you don't normally see such regularity of the two flat and steep axes 90 degrees away from each other. Next slide. We then move to more sophisticated instrumentation, which is probably the instruments that you use now in your office that allow you to do all kinds of things with corneal modeling and topography. Now the facts um, is that 10% of corneal transplant eyes, at least in the 1990s, could use lenses. Now obviously we'll be a little higher now, but don't be surprised that this number is not all that great. Probably keratoconus patients are about 30% success rates post-PKP because they're younger patients and more in tune to using uh, contact lenses. And post-graft astigmatism ranges between three and a half to five diopters. And I made the statement, really, if we were lucky, it was three and a half to five diopters. Next. And it's all in the transition zones between the corneal tissue and its suture line relationship or wound edge to the peripheral cornea uh, and the peripheral cornea, whether it has any thinning or abnormalities to it versus a normal peripheral cornea. Next. And you can see how you can get into trouble putting a graft uh, into a, 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 a host opening. And any slippage when you're doing the trephinization of the donor cornea will produce irregularity. And then if the block itself has any defects to it, um, you can get uh, an abnormal uh, recipient button. Next slide. And here's a, an example of a cornea that's well healed, the graft sutures out, but you can see that between 7 and 8 o'clock, the thickened 
uh, uh, scar that's right in the interface that will produce some distortion to the uh, Myers. Next. So our goals of contact lens fittings is definitely adequate centration is the big thing and good movement. Next slide. I have this centration scale that I developed and used in my office and I teach my technical staff uh, to utilize this. A 3 over 3 is a perfectly centered graph that's equal on both the 3 and 9 o'clock uh, clock hours. The plus 2 is a uh, contact lens that's off a little bit, either decentered nasal or temporal about a millimeter or two. And then a plus one is an inadequate fit where you're catching the edge of the lens, you're not getting good optics. A lens may sit there, but it's not an adequate fit. Next. So just for the fun of it, here's a little quick quiz. <clears throat> here's a contact lens sitting on the eye. Uh, take a peek at it, and the question is, what's, what, how would you call this lens centration? Next. And not to keep you in suspense, this would be a two over three. It's still got good optics, but it's moved over a millimeter or two. Next. And then we look at different patterns of corneal topography. Here's a pretty much with the rule uh, steep axis. And how will the lens fit? Next. Typically, the lens here will fit <clears throat> from 6 to 12 o'clock. And um, we're not getting the bearing in of this lens, so it's an adequate fit. Uh, next. Now, in this topography, you see steep at 3 o'clock. How is the lens going to fit? Next it's going to slide to the steep axis. So you'll hear us say that the lens will move to the steep axis. Next. So what about good movement? Let's go on. Obviously, once again, it's that 12 o'clock that often causes a lot of problems of digging in. But here, not only do you have the digging in, as we showed in the neovascularization, but look at the air bubble that's developed there. So you've got the air bubble blocking oxygenation, and you've got the lens as well doing it. Next. What about the appropriate time to fit? Well, everyone's a little different, so I'll give you my own opinion. I like to fit early, and that means roughly at about three months post-op. I must have a quiet eye, a stable refraction, and steroid already reduced one time a day. Next. The other thing we talk about with patients uh, after corneal transplants, and it holds true after fitting them with contacts, is that the fitting is very time consuming. I, I like to tell the patients that this is not a soft contact lens fit in a teenager. Uh, this is a difficult fit, it's time consuming. Also, we instruct them about the uh, acronym RSVP, which stands for redness, sunlight sensitivity, vision problems, or pain. And if they have any of these four major problems, they are to RSVP us right away. And finally, this concept of decreased contrast sensitivity is something to discuss with the patient. There's no question that graft patients have decreased sensitivity, especially at nighttime, and they must be careful. They do better with contacts than they do in glasses when it re in relationship to this. Next slide shows a cornea on its side, looking at its profile. This is a normal cornea. We're looking with a pentacam type image. Next. And as we look with Schleim flu subtraction, uh, optics, we can see a normal cornea, normal curvature. Next. But most of my graphs have a plateau shape. They're flattened centrally, and then they have this mid peripheral kind of bulge, and then hopefully a normal peripheral cornea, a plateau shaped graph. Next. Keratoconus patient, you can see some thinning uh, down uh, over on the left hand side. Next. Is a typical keratoglobus. Next slide. So based on the concept that most of our graphs had this plateau shape, in the mid-90s, we were playing around with trying to make our own fitting set for post-graft fitting. And I worked with a good team of a manufacturer, uh, Dean Clements, a contact lens fitter, Mr. Literal, and my optometrist, Vivian Smith, and we came up with a new contact lens design for graphs. Uh, it gently vaulted the plateau-shaped cornea. It had a multi-curve. Uh, design with um, a center base cur curve and four peripheral curves. I'll show you that in a minute. Two point touch. We had a 93% success rate at one year and it came in two diameters. Next slide. And here's the sagittal profile of this lens. And I'll just say that the uh, peripheral four curves were to mimic a 
uh, normal peripheral corneal contour. Next slide. So then on an, uh, a normal cornea without a graft, it would be too steep. On a keratoconus, it would be too flat. But um, on a post graft, it would fit just about right. Next slide. Any of those lenses with the condition and fit, not really bothering the limbus. Next slide. And here's the two point touch that we're talking about. Next. Now, what about indications for refractive surgery? Well, first of all, we move on to refractive surgery, it's because we have a glasses and contact lens failure. They tried everything, nothing's working. The sutures are out, and we have stable K readings. Next. We want to just touch base about the concepts of corner relaxing incisions, which we work on the steep meridian to flatten it, or wedge resections, where we work on the flat meridian to steepen it. Next. From a historical standpoint, I'll just jump down to Dick Troutman in 1977 for corner relaxing incisions and 1972 on wedge resections. And Troutman really wrote the Bible of book on corneal surgery in, 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 the, in the 1990s. Next. Some of these pictures are from his book where he's showing here the relaxing incision at 60 degrees and a patient has 10 degree, uh, 10 diopters of astigmatism. Next. And you can see that we do this for <clears throat> less than eight diopters routinely. Sutures are out. We use a microsharp blade at the wound, uh, usually about 75 to 80% depth. Uh, typically, we do about uh, three clock hours or 90 degrees. And it can be performed in the office at the slit lamp under topical anesthesia. Next slide. Here's a picture of using a diamond blade or a microsharp blade to do just a relaxing incision within the graft interface. Next slide is talking about wedge resections. Now we're working on the flat axis at the 150 degree axis in this 10 degree, uh, <clears throat> scooty 10 diopter, uh, astigmat. Next, and here we're gonna remove some tissue. We go down three quarter depth at the transplant wound, but then we make a second per perpendicular incision, angle down to the base. This is for three clock hours. The spacing between the first and second incision is mathematically determined depending on how many diopters we want to correct, and that's the formula, 0.1 millimeters uh, width equals one diopter of correction. Usually it's under peribulbar anesthesia in the OR. We use 10 nylon sutures uh, for closure, and we'll usually get easily six to seven diopters of correction. Next. And here schematically you can see the two incisions. Next. And now we're taking a little Van S scissor and removing the tissue. Next, and we suture that up. Now look what happens with this. Um, here's some pre-op and post-op. This is about a 10 to 15 diopter difference between the pre-op and post-op. And we're working on that flat area at four o'clock. Next slide. Again, you can see a post-op working at seven o'clock now. And again, we're probably getting about 15 diopters of correction. So you get huge diopters of correction with the wedge resection. But my favorite is relaxing incision compression sutures, uh, specifically on topography. And Dr. Smith and I wrote an article on this on the Journal of Refractive Surgery in 1996. Here again, sutures are out, contact lens intolerant. Obviously, the testing is usual, visual acuity, manifest refraction, Ks, so on. All made within the keratoplasty wound, uh, less than 90 degrees. And then we do corneal suturing in a, the opposite flat meridian. Everything is done on topography. So let's take a look at how we design this. <clears throat> Here you can see the steep meridians at four and 10 o'clock are getting the relaxing incisions and the uh, flat meridians at two o'clock and seven o'clock are getting the sutures. The shorter flat meridian gets two sutures. The larger flat meridian gets three sutures. Next slide will show you the clinical picture <clears throat> of this patient. Next slide. We're talking about how do we increase the effect when we do this? Well, you can go deeper on your radial incisions, more central, move them in, or go uh, longer uh, number of degrees. Typically, I don't like to go more than three clock hours. And what was the effect? Well, the effect, as you can see here, the yellow is the post-op results, and we've moved everything to the left where the better visual acuities are. Next. If we do lines of improvement, you can see that we've moved people uh, on over to plus one to plus nine lines of improvement. Next slide. 
And here's a summary slide of this 56% reduction of astigmatism, mean refractive cylinder, decreased 5.3 diopters. Delta K, change in K, was reduced 90%. Visual acuity improvement, 75% and reversal of cylinder axis we could actually accomplish in 45% of the patients. Next slide. Okay, so our final thought is what about LASIK or PRK, surface laser, and this is a case of PRK, and this was a patient 29 years old, keratoconus in the right eye, uh, and you can see the level of vision of 2060-ish, had a graft on the left eye, <clears throat> was 2100, uncorrected 2025, but with a really kind of difficult prescription. Next slide. Here is the uh, right eye, the keratoconus eye. You can see typical keratoconus. Next. Here's the graph before I removed the sutures. Next. And on this left eye, the patient wanted better vision, but she was contact lens intolerant. The uh, graph was clear, sutures out, so we discussed either relaxing and compression sutures or surface laser, the patient elected surface laser. Next slide. So surface laser is pretty easy. Um, you do it on the manifest refraction. We can also do wavefront correction on custom LASIK, and we, she had a custom LASIK on this. Initially, she had four and a half diopters of sill. Next slide. And here you can see her pre-surgery, and you can't tell, but the numbers tell us that she has four and a half diopters of cylinder. Next. And she's now reduced in the post-surgical to 2.8 diopters of cylinder. Next slide. And here's her uh, number. She's 2025 now uncorrected. <clears throat> Basically 2020 with a much better refraction. And she only has 2.5 diopters cylinder. She's obviously a very happy camper. Next slide. Here is the clinical picture showing a very clear central corneal graft. Next. And my final slide is just that the cornea is the grand piano for emotropic music in the eye. This was a comment made by Dr. Fyodorov from Russia several years ago. And if you have any questions, please feel free. There's my website, cofflervisiongroup.com. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so very much, Dr. Koffler. We're going to definitely ask you a lot of questions from your ex experience and your perspective as a cornea specialist. Next, we're going to move on to Dr. Renee Reeder and her cases that she's going to present about fitting these unique uh, corneal transplants. Uh, Dr. Renee Reeder is a graduate of the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Optometry and completed a residency in advanced cornea and contact lens management at Indiana University. She is an associate professor at the Illinois College of Optometry where she began the contact lens residency program and served as the chief at the cornea, at the cornea Center for Clinical Excellence at the Illinois Eye Institute for 14 years. She's been recognized with the Dean's Awards for Cutting Edge Teaching and for Excellence in Leadership. Dr. Reeder is active in research and continuing education in the areas of dry eye, scleral lenses, keratoconus, and other cornea and contact lens related issues. She is a diplomate in the cornea and contact lens section of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. She has received multiple honors for her community service, including a 2008 Lions, Lions of Illinois Foundation Fellow, one of the Illinois JC's 10 Outstanding Young People of 2009, a District 1J Golden Lion Award for 2010, and an International President Appreciation Award from Lions Clubs International in 2015. She currently serves the District 1J Lions as leader, jo leader dog chairperson, site first grant project chairperson, and zone chair two for the southeastern region. Um, I'm going to hand over the next presentation to Dr. Reeder. Thank you, Lynette. It's my pleasure to be uh, back here doing some of these awesome webinars sponsored by the Boston Group and talk, tell you a little bit about some of the interesting cases that I have the opportunity to see at uh, the Illinois College of Optometry. So um, my first patient is actually a patient I've been following on and off for several years. She has a very interesting story to tell. She says she was diagnosed with keratoconus and 
was referred to um, a corneal specialist and that she got there and the gentleman said, I think you need a transplant and I have a deal for you. Um, he was doing what he referred to as a sutureless corneal transplant and he needed a patient to be willing to be on TV and um, if she would be willing to have surgery the next week, um, then she was going to be that person and there would be no charge for her for um, his services. So she underwent the surgery. Um, unfortunately, the wound did dehiss. Um, she did end up having to have some sutures. She feels like her vision is actually worse now than it was prior to the surgery. Um, she's also um, gone back through all of her post-operative notes and she does not recall taking a steroid and nowhere in her post-operative paperwork can she find that she was ever given any sort of anti-inflammatory, only an antibiotic, which uh, likely explains the deep neovascularization that we do see um, on her cornea, especially from the one to two um, uh, o'clock hours. And just to kind of give you a little idea of how she sees, she's been unsuccessful to date um, with lenses and she's uncorrected in that eye at 2600. The eye does pinhole to about 2200 and best we're able to do with a spectacle is a minus 18 and brings her down to about 2100. So again, if you take a look at this eye, you can truly appreciate there's a great deal of deep vascularization, especially um, between like the noon to two o'clock range, and it really does move down into the cornea. She's looking down just slightly. Um, the graft is slightly decentered inferiorly as well. So if we take a look at her topography, um, you'll see there's definitely a, an area, the valley, um, a low spot superiorly, and then an elevated area nasally. Her Ks are actually 44-ish by 49, so she has roughly five diopters of astigmatism. And you can look see at the image simulation that she's just got kind of multiple, um, multiple images. You know, mon monocular triplopia, I think, would be a safe assessment. So we really were trying to see what we could do for her on the placido disc. Again, you can really appreciate how irregular um, the surface is and how uneven the mires are. So uh, we started things off by trying a post-surgical lens design, a lens with reverse geometry, hoping that we could um, kind of get it to center a little bit better and stay on, but we were unsuccessful. We were able to improve the vision to 2070, but the lens just would not stay on the eye. Lots of bubbles inferiorly and some touch over the steeper zones. So we decided to go a little larger, again, trying to get better centration, tucking this lens in. It was also a reverse geometry type of design with a steep periphery, again, trying to limit those bubbles. And at first, it looked pretty good, a little bit of a touch um, in some areas, but vision was now 2060. But unfortunately, this lens didn't stay in this position. It would gradually drift inferior, and if she took an extreme gaze, the lens would dislodge. So it was particularly problematic when she was driving and she cut her eyes to the side to look in her side mirrors, and the lens would slide off. So we were looking for other options. So when cornea sclerals became available, our first lens that I had was a 13.5 diameter, and I said, well, you know, let's try something. She, and um, we went for, again, this is a cornea scleral, so there is some alignment to touch um, in on the center, and then lots of uh, clearance around the limbus and tear exchanges, um, certainly a big part of what you will see on a cornea scleral type of design. But even so, she was really struggling with get the lens, getting the lenses on and off. So more recently, um, a couple years ago, she came back to me again and said, you know what, I really want to try wearing a lens again. So we embarked on a larger scleral, and ultimately we ended up in a 15.6 diameter lens. It has an 8.6 optic, and you'll notice it is a pentacurve, so it does have four peripheral curves that start relatively steep relative to the base curve, so our central base curve is a 6.2, and then the next curve is a 6.45, and then that's a rather wide curve, and then we start to flatten out, and we have very flat peripheral curves to, to make sure we get good tear exchange on this lens. We did make the lens out of Boston XO2 so that we have a little more oxygen um, getting through to that cornea. 
So taking a look at the lens at dispense, you'll see the OCT here, showing us that centrally we do have 290 microns, and I usually do aim for about 300, so I was pretty happy with this appearance. So we did dispense the lens, and the patient came back, and you'll notice it's 10 hours of wear, she still had 180 microns of clearance, which I was pretty excited about. So we did have that 100 to 110 microns of settling during the course of the day. We had a little bit of mucus build up that you can see towards the end of the day, but really and truly a pretty clean interface, good clearance throughout, and um, just a marked improvement in her vision. So we also take a look here at that host junction as well as the limbus and you can see we have an excellent clearance in this area as well. Um, it does land out onto the conjunctiva and you can kind of see the tears kind of coming up over the edge of the, of the lens on this one as well. So here is the with fluorescein looking at the lens and what you'll see is just nice and green and even throughout and really nice clearance over the limbus. So the green tends to bleed out onto the conjunctiva letting you know that you're getting good tear exchange. So this lens you can put it, it can be on for about 10 hours, you can paint the surface with fluorescein and it will, you will see the fluorescein go up underneath it so that we know we haven't, don't have a sealed system which is particularly important in the, given the the fact that she does have significant vascularization and surprisingly with all of that vascularization she's actually 2040 with this lens. So our next patient kind of similar but we took a different turn for her, a little bit younger, 38 years old. Um, she'd actually had some trauma, she's a keratoconic patient and ultimately needed a transplant. Um, also developed a little bit of a traumatic cataract. Um, her graft is a little bit decentered, and so again, we struggled with getting a lens to center um, and a bit of a cliff, if you will, at the inferior aspect of the graft. So when we would try to do a soft lens to help center the corneal lenses, they just fluted terribly inferiorly, trying to use um, a high DK traditional silicone hydrogel type of lens, just couldn't get it to work. So she had kind of given up and she was back and she was like, I'm frustrated, I want to see better. And so we uh, decided to try our, a different kind of approach for her. But if we take a look at why the lenses were so important, again, she's a minus 12 with a minus one in spectacle, 2080 at best corrected. You can see we do have a lot more corneal cell, 4784 by 5265. She has um, 11.3, so a pretty normal HBID. But if you notice, I've noted here that the right eye is hyperopic. She's actually about a plus four, minus four-ish. Um, so she's a significant hyper with significant astigmatism in the other eye. So she's got a good 13, 14 doctors of aniso, almost a true antibiotrope between the two eyes. So she's not able to wear that in spectacles. As we take a look at her placido disc images, you can see that significant sill in the right eye as well as in the left eye with that more of the big change being inferiorly as you see that the, the uh, Myers are kind of dragged inferiorly and that was really our struggle with fitting um, many of the lenses and getting them to kind of align in that area. Taking a look at the topographies, you can see the keratoconus on the right eye um, and then on the left eye, it almost looks like a cone eye as well, looking at this transplant and um, noting that again, her case are in 50, 56, so she's got quite a bit of, of cylinder here as well. So here is a picture of her graft. She is dilated in this picture, but it does go to show you that, that this graft is slightly temporal, um, and it's a fairly large graft because fairly far inferior. Um, but centrally, it's very nice and clear. It's just a little decentered, almost kind of tilted um, in its appearance when you take a look at it on profile. So we decided this time to try a soft lens for her to try to get better centration and better comfort. Um, and we, were, we decided to use the Kerasoft IC in large part because we have the ability to adjust the periphery of this lens and the fact that we do get pretty good um, oxygen transmission with the material it's made of. 
I tend to err on the flat side because I feel that the main thing is to know that the base curve has a lot to do with the quality of the vision and often a flatter base curve provides better vision. So I started with my flatter lens in the set, which was the 8.8, and we did get good visual acuity on overfraction. Um, however, the fit was quite poor. It, the edges were, again, the, that same problem with fluting. The optic zone was slightly decentered. So I was going to go to the next step steeper in my fitting set. Unfortunately, uh, one of the students had torn it, so it was not available. So um, I made a bigger jump and went to the 8.2 lens. And when I put this lens on, that optic zone just centered perfectly, but it didn't move enough. We really want to see about a millimeter of movement, and we just didn't have that. So this was a little bit too steep, so, um, but now we also had the problem, the vision was now fluctuating, so we didn't have as good a quality of vision, and of note was the fact that immediately after the blink, it was clear, so you had that clear, blurry, steep base curve problem. So um, we decided to make some adjustments. I went with the 8.8 base curve because it did provide good quality of vision. And I went two steps steeper in the periphery, um, not all the way to the three step, which would have been that 8.2 in the periphery, um, but to the, um, the two step, which would have been equivalent to like an 8.4 in the periphery, hoping that would um, eliminate the fluting and yet still get us some movement. And while we still had excellent vision, 20, 30 minus, um, we were still seeing this bubble. So we weren't quite there yet in the periphery. You can see the marking on the lens is, is right up and down. We have no rotation here. It's really um, from that perspective and we're pretty happy with the lens, but we need to make some adjustments still um, on the fitting as well as the fact we had a little situation. Then. So we went to A6. Went, stayed with a too steep to get to hopefully get rid of that bubble which we were successful for and when we got this more stable fit you'll see here the vision improved even more so we've that 20 30 plus on dispense and once she adapted to the lens on um, her follow-up visit she improved to 2025 20, and you can see here it just looks like a, a happy soft contact lens um, fitting quite well with little rotation she said she did extremely well so with both of these cases, I think we brought them along as new things were available and provided them remarkable improvement in their vision and quality of life. Thank you so much, Dr. Reeder. What great cases. And it just goes to show that not one single lens modality is the magic way to handle these different and complicated corneal transplants and we're going to discuss that a little bit more in further detail. Um, but next I'd like to introduce Dr. Jill Beyer. Dr. Beyer is currently a clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Beyer previously served as the director of the contact lens department at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary as the director of the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary Optometric Residency in Ocular Disease and Cornea and Contact Lenses. She also was an instructor in ophthalmology for Harvard Medical School. So Dr. Beyer is uh, going to present a very unique and challenging case that she has, um, she has seen in her practice. Thank you, Lynette, and thank you everyone for allowing me to share my case with you today. And this patient just started out um, with actually the corneal specialist um, where I am telling me he had a patient for me that he was really hoping I could get up and running very quickly. The patient had been through a lot and he was hoping I could rehabilitate his vision very quickly. So I decided to take a look back in the chart. And I noticed that the patient had pellucid, marginal degeneration. He was on his second graft in the right eye, first graft in the left, was aphakic in the right eye, and thus anisometropic, and had angle closure glaucoma due to a few complications. So let me just introduce you to our patient. He is a 54-year-old male. And I'm just going to review the case a little bit, a little bit of the history to set the stage for the actual lens fit. So he had had a PK in the left eye in 2000, but was having worsening ectasia in the right eye and poor success with lens fits. So they had decided to completely visually rehabilitate the left eye, do a cataract extraction, and when that eye was rehabilitated, then move to the right eye and do a PK. I also noticed in the chart that the patient had 
poppy disease, and they had prescribed Predforte and Patinol. And I was quite uh, pleased to see this because I know there are a few things that I feel can increase your success rate with contact lens fits that you can do before the lens fit even commences. So let's take a look at how this graph looked. So this is just a couple weeks after the first graft occurred. Um, this is not how we want the graft to look. This is not the outcome you're looking for. Unfortunately, this patient developed a severe ulcer. And when they performed the culture, they found an unusual bug. This particular bacteria is usually found in the bacteria or in the saliva of dogs. Uh, and this gentleman had several dogs that he was quite fond of. So I was looking at this picture and thinking, wow, you know, this is tricky. I'm looking at it from a contact lens perspective and thinking, this looks like a sunken graft, um, which can be a tricky fit. And I know from the history that there's a bleb, so that um, creates a problem for scleral lenses. Now, if we look at it six weeks later, it looks much better. Uh, almost looks like a different eye if you look at it. So the graft host junction no longer has edema, um, and things are looking better in that manner. However, once the ulcer is resolved, which we were very excited to see, um, unfortunately they had to repeat um, a PK and decided to extract the lens at the same time. And this was after a long period of, of um, antibiotic use for this patient. He, he was very tired of coming to the doctor every few days for many, many months. So we finally um, performed the PK and let's take a look at how that one turned out. So much better, things are looking dramatically better. The only thing that I'm noticing from a contact lens perspective is this large pupil. So that could create some issues for glare. However, it could be pharmacologically induced. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out. Um, at this point, the patient was sent to me for a contact lens over a fraction appointment. And this is very common. For those of you that work with corneal specialists, they often will send the patient to you for this appointment just to get an idea of the visual outcome of the procedure. And it's typically before the patient is actually ready for contact lens wear. Their eye is not there yet. Um, and I used to feel that this appointment was not that helpful to myself. I knew it was very helpful to the surgeon, but I didn't think it benefited you know, the contact lens fitting. Um, however, I have changed my mind. I actually think this is a great appointment. It's a great time to introduce yourself to the patient, to um, explain to the patient how the contact lens fitting will proceed, and also, uh, most importantly, pre-treat the eye. And this is something that I really think can help make your contact lens fitting run much more smoothly. I often have patients, like most doctors, use extensive amounts of um, preservative-free artificial tears, perhaps a thicker uh, gel drop at night. I'll often ask them to increase their water consumption and decrease any non-prescribed diuretics like caffeine, alcohol, artificial sweeteners. And this sounds like a trivial point, but I don't believe it is. Um, I had one patient who was drinking an entire pot of coffee a day and virtually no water. And she was able to get herself down eventually to one cup of coffee a day and drinking more water, more electrolytes, and her eyes felt dramatically better. And the contact lens fit after that went very smoothly. So such a small thing can really make a difference in how the lens fit is experienced to the patient. I often will have patients also consider using humidifier, aggressively treating allergies, lid disease, and then ergonomics is something I talk to them about as well. And I know this sounds, again, very simplistic, but it can make a big difference. If we think about the number of hours all of us are spending on the computer a day or on our iPads or any digital item, um, there's a lot of room for dryness there. And some people have their computers up above, they have them to the side, they're positioned in strange places. And if you think about yourself just looking up all day, that's very drying and causes a lot of eye fatigue. If you think about a rigid lens wear, looking up or to the side, their um, odds of ejection are going to go up. So just mentioning these things, getting patients ready for this, in the habit of doing this a few months before the actual lens fit, can really increase your odds of the patient feeling like they're in control and that they're doing something before the lens fit um, ever occurs. So now, five months later, things are looking even better. The pupil has come down a bit, a few sutures have been removed. And this is another item that Dr. Koffler was uh, mentioning, how removing sutures can be of benefit. So if we look at the next slide, 
Here we remove sutures, and we're down to eight and a quarter diopters of astigmatism. So the next slide, we remove even more sutures, and we have four and a half diopters of astigmatism. So anything that can be done to normalize the shape of the cornea is going to make the lens fit easier for you and easier for the patient. So let's look at the actual lens fit. So we went with the easiest solution first, one day disposable in the right eye to fix the aphakia. And we thought this would be a good idea for this particular patient because if something like dog saliva were to get in the eye, the lens could easily be tossed away. And then glasses were worn on top and the patient was actually happy with the vision. Interestingly though, he was unhappy with the handling of the soft lens. He had been wearing rigid lenses for his whole life and really um, just wanted that instead, and I was more than happy to help with that. So we went to Old Faithful, to the GP lens. And if we look at this just uh, systematically, the lens fit is, is quite not complicated. If you look at the central three millimeters on your topography, uh, and then pick a trial lens near that. And that's what I did. I just selected one actually from my old optometry school um, gas permeable lens fitting set. We didn't have many fitting sets initially when I arrived at my new job, and I was used to having a whole room full of them, but I have learned to be very efficient with my trial lenses. So I was able to put it on, get an over refraction. The lens was sliding all over, but when held centrally, the lens fit actually looked not bad. The central pattern was good, a little bit steep, but it had a high edge. So that was the only lens I put on, and I sent the patient home. And then we moved on to actually designing the lens. So looking now at the Ks at six to nine millimeters and noticing that they're steeper. And this, of course, indicates a plateau cornea, and so decided to go with a reverse geometry lens. And here, just picking the base curve based on our trial lens, and then the diameter I shows based on what I saw from the trial lens on the eye, what looked like it would work well for this patient, using the over fraction, and then a three diopter reverse curve. And then the Boston XO2 was the material chosen because of the high oxygen permeability and sort of a moderate specific gravity, which is great because some of the more mid-range DK lenses are a little higher. And since this is an aphakic lens, we want anything that's gonna help the lens not be so heavy and not slide downward. So. The patient came in when the lens came in and was very happy with the vision. The lens was sliding a little bit temporally, but when held centrally, it had a nice central pattern, but a little bit of a high edge. So at this point, there were a few things that needed to be done to fix the lens fit. So the first order of business was enlarging the lens, and that will help with centration. And then the second order of business was bringing the edge, so increasing the reverse curve. And when this uh, lens came in and the patient came in, it centered very nicely over the graph and the pupil, had an appropriate edge lift, no ejection, no SPK. So this was just with two lenses we were able to get this patient up and running. And if I think about it, on the second lens I had actually called my lab consultant to ask him, you know, did you agree with the changes I'm making? How do you think these, um, this will go. And uh, I think if I had called him on the first lens, uh, he probably would have talked me into going with a larger lens right off the bat. And if I had paid attention a little bit better to my topography, I would have known to go a little bit higher on the reverse curve. So this fit could have actually been done in one lens. So there's a couple pearls I think we can all take from this case that were sort of um, I, they were reinforced for me throughout this case, and that was the importance of pre-treating the eye. Set yourself up for success to make this a smooth lens fit. Develop a relationship with your corneal specialist. We're all on the same team here, and we all want to get these patients seeing as well as possible as soon as possible. Uh, efficiently use trial lenses. You really don't need a whole room of trial lenses. Um, just enough. You'll need some, of course, but just enough to get the maximum amount of information out of the least number of lenses. And then utilize and learn from lab consultants. They're there waiting to talk about your lens fit all day long, so don't be afraid to call them. They're a wealth of information, and they really can help you decrease the number of times you're going to see each patient because they'll help you get a better fit for each lens. And then I usually talk to them every now and then and ask them what lenses are people using out there, what's working, what's not, and this helps in future lens fits to decrease the number of lenses you have to try on. So really, I think if I had used all of these little 
tricks that we've been presenting to you today in my initial lens fits, um, a lot more of them would have felt like average lens fits as opposed to these long, complicated affairs. So hopefully these things we've um, presented you, to you today will help everyone feel a little less intimidated about corneal transplant lens fitting. Thank you so much, Dr. Beyer. I truly appreciate your con contribution to tonight's uh, presentation. I can't imagine uh, dog saliva in my eye, but uh, I'm sure it happens. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do right now is that we're going to take some of your questions. Um, please feel free to write your questions in the question bar. And I have a few questions of my own to ask um, the presenters. And I know that Dr. Koffler touched on this about um, when he would actually recommend a uh, fitting after a transplant. He said around three months under certain criteria. And uh, basically, um, I want to ask him a little more in detail about uh, you know any exceptions for um, less than three months or more than three months, as well as what's been the experience of Dr. Reeder and Dr. Byer. So Dr. Koffler? Well, Lynette, um, it's a great question, and certainly it differs from one surgeon to another surgeon. But after years of doing this, I have kind of moved uh, my uh, timing up a little bit so that at about three months, I think most patients are ready to be considered for a contact lens fit. Uh, before this, I am, you know, about six weeks to eight weeks, I'm looking at removing uh, maybe a critically tight suture to try to get the cornea a little bit more spherical so that I'm ready at about three months or so. Patients uh, now have to get back to work and they need to get back to driving and so they're really kind of moving us along. I think as long as you have a quiet eye, an eye that is down on the steroid dose to about once a day, it's uh, not, a, not a, any longer uncomfortable to manipulate around the eye, I'm ready to go and send the patient over to my contact lens team to get fit. Dr. Reeder, uh, what's been your experience with uh, fitting? How soon after a transplant have you been uh, referred for a fitting? Most of um, the surgeons out up here by us uh, refer after about six months. We have some that actually keep them even longer than that. But typical, um, typically I'll see them back in my chair in about six months. Um, it also depends a little bit on the types of sutures. Most of the surgeons that I see uh, their transplants up here do multiple interrupted sutures. So this, the su they're a little they're still taking a lot of sutures out still and so they're a little slower to I think to send them over. So for me, um, I find that most of the patients are referred over at about three to six months. So it seems like that's pretty common where I have been. Um, but I sort of leave it up to the surgeon when they feel that eye is ready for the lens to be put on the eye. Excellent points. Um, and we're talking about sutures and contact lens fitting. Um, how do you manage the sutures typically and, and, and contact lens fitting? Because um, sometimes you just can't get that fit to stabilize because of the extreme irregularity. And so, um, Dr. Reeder, Dr. Beyer, when do you say when and you're for the patient back for adjustments to the sutures? Um, and Dr. Koffler, to you, do you actually send the patient out even though they have the high sill just to see what may happen or do you address it ahead of time? So I'll start with Dr. Reeder. <laughs> Um, well, I guess it depends on the refractive error and the types of sutures. If they're particularly tight and they're bulging, um, a lot of times I will try to just do a soft lens over them until things kind of calm down. Other times, uh, if there's a problem overlying the sutures, I will just vault over them. Um, uh, you know, if they're pretty normal and they're pretty buried, I know it doesn't seem to impact too much of what I do. So my main uh, concern is just that the 
Hopefully there's no intention of removing sutures once the patient is sent to me for a contact lens fit because that's going to change the corneal curvature for sure. So you never want to start your lens fit, this complicated lens fit, if sutures are planning uh, to be removed in the next you know, month or sooner. Uh, so that would be my main thing is just make sure you discuss that with the patient and possibly the corneal surgeon that um, we all know that it's going to be a while before any sutures will be removed, if at all. And um, you know, it's it, it, it's an issue that actually could take a long period of time to talk about. But uh, starting out as a surgeon, it depends: did I put in a running suture with four cardinal sutures at uh, 12, 3, 6, and 9, so that I'm only looking at the four interrupted sutures to remove, or did I put 16 interrupted sutures in 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 a case? Uh, but I'm looking at the advent of corneal topography is really nice because you can use that tool to look at the sutures uh, early and, and the whole picture of, the, of the, uh, the shape of the graft. And I can remove sutures as long as I have the backup of a running to prevent, again, any kind of wound separation. Uh, or I can remove a loose suture or a tight suture if I have interrupted sutures right next to it that I feel is going to hold the wound closed. So we'd like to get to it early because if we remove a suture early that's tight, we'll get a better effect than if we sit there and wait to you get a lot of scarring in the interface and the suture isn't uh, the only thing anymore that is uh, creating the tightness. So it's a long discussion, Lynette, but basically I like to get to it early and uh, look at topography and remove sutures um, as safely and as quickly as I can. Well, it's definitely helpful to hear your perspective. And, uh, and actually, um, a, an additional question is, if you're referring a patient to us to fit, when do you want to see that patient back? Like as soon as we're done fitting, how, how would you like to, for us to co-manage with you as a surgeon? Because this is, after all, your work <laughs> that we are um, trying to also help rehabilitate uh, in, at the same time. Well, most corneal surgeons uh, tend to like to follow their, their uh, patients closely. We've, we've gotten burnt so many times with a loose suture or uh, a small infiltrate that gets started. So we, uh, we tend to like to watch my, uh, have my transplant patients on every three months. And, and maybe I'm an overkill type of person, but I, I think it, it is, it's, it's nice for me personally to touch base with them and I feel really good making sure that the graft is uh, remaining to be nice and clear. This is before and after contact lens wear. So I would say that um, uh, when I send the patient over to the contact lens team, I want them to do their job, but I'm going to ch be checking that patient with their lens at about three months. Excellent. And uh, this is going to be more related to the contact lens uh, fitters and what their strategy is. And we've got a lot of questions coming through that are related. So um, Dr. Reeder and Dr. Bayer, uh, do you apply the same fitting strategy for each transplant? Do you have a, a regime that you start with one lens? If that doesn't work, you go to the next? Or how do you approach each um, each transplant uh, when it comes across your your chair. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Beyer. So for me, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. You really want to find out who the patient is, what's the patient like, and then also what is their eye like and what's the ocular environment. So that can change your selection dramatically. So all of those things, what we sort of intuitively notice when a patient sits down in the chair. Um, I certainly try to go from the easiest perspective to uh, more complicated. Um, certainly corneal lens before a scleral lens, they have to prove to me that they um, cannot be fit with a corneal lens before I'll move to a scleral lens. And then using a soft lens when it looks like it's the right, the right move. So it's really case by case for every patient. Dr. Reader? I would tend to agree. Yeah, I would tend to agree it really varies from patient to patient. It also depends a lot on the graft itself. Is it a sunken graft? Is it a decentered graft? That may change what I need to do. If it's significantly decentered, I'm becoming more and more inclined to go ahead and go to a scleral or a soft lens. If I look at that map and go, it's gonna go off center. Um, but I will, and I, I will 
occasionally do a piggyback as well with some graph. I'll put a, a moderate amount of plus in a uh, silicone hydrogel disposable lens with a high decay corneal lens over top, and um, that usually will really help that that uh, corneal lens center well. So I think it it depends a lot on on what I'm seeing and uh, to Dr. Byer's point, that patient as well, because there are definitely some patients who they did this because they hate corneal lenses and <laughs> you pull one out and there's no way they're going to let you put that on their eye. And Dr. Koffler, you, you also have perspective on, on strategies as well. Would you, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, you know, I think this is such an exciting time for fitting corneal transplants with that um, in the old days we had one or two systems that we used and, and, and we were very limited. We were limited in manufacturing. Uh, we didn't have much in soft lenses. Uh, but nowadays, think about it. Um, we have everything from uh, specially uh, soft contact lenses uh, and materials to a whole array of gas perm, reverse geometry, um, custom uh, uh, creation of manufacturing of both gas perm and soft. So when you say should we use the same fitting strategy, the, the answer is absolutely not. We have to take in the personality of the patient, but then we've got to let the fitter go for it uh, because there's so much there. I just would also like to encourage those fitters out there who are listening in um, to please be open and, uh, and flexible and have lots of different uh, fitting sets available to them and constantly be reading about the new stuff that comes out. So this is a question that came up, um, and the question is, how do you choose the lens for your contact lens over refraction? What do you typically use? Dr. Uh, Byer? Can, yeah, you might want to. Sure. Um, so that's actually probably the easiest appointment ever. Pick any lens that is not steep. <laughs> <laughs> or does not have a bubble because really you're not fitting the lens here you're only putting the lens on to find out what their visual outcome is I usually try to select something that I think is going to fit well anyway so I can sort of kill two birds with one stone and get a jump on the lens fit but um, I know some of the ophthalmology residents, they'll just carry around one rigid lens in their pocket and that will allow them to do most contact lens over refraction. So it's really just getting the visual acuity outcome and it has nothing to do with the fit or anything like that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, this is a question I think more directed to you, Dr. Reeder. When would you go to a scleral GP lens versus a Kerasoft contact lens? I typically will try a scleral first, but it depends. I mean, on someone who's got a really straightforward RX um, where they've got a reasonable refraction, you can get them somewhere on a refraction. A soft, Kerasoft lens will a lot of times do well enough and um, sometimes will do better than you expect. So I do. I do realize that the oxygen transmission is not phenomenal, so it's certainly not my first go-to lens for these patients. But if they, uh, you know, if I can't get a traditional hydro, uh, silicone hydrogel on there, and I need some, put that patient in a soft lens for comfort, handling, whatever the other reasons are, and I can get some sort of a refraction on there, I will occasionally go to um, the Kerasoft first before I go to a scleral. Yes, and using Kerasoft, you know, the, the, there is that ability to change segments of the periphery. So when you're, mm -hmm. say for instance, you're piggybacking a lens and you get edge fluting with a standard soft lens, you actually can tuck that down with the Kerasoft if for whatever reason the patient doesn't want to go with a corneal GP or a scleral as well. So there are those advantages with the Kerasoft lens design. Um, one of the other questions is, how, how long are you educating patients on daily wear time for scleral lenses and are you prescribing inhalation solution as solution? Um, so typically I'm recommending about 10 hours of wear. I do use the inhalation saline for filling the bowl. Um, I think it's just easier to have fresh sterile saline every single time, so that is what I recommend. And I would agree with Dr. Reeder on both those points. I 
Yes, and Dr. Koffler, any comments about scleral lens wear and time? Uh, yeah, I think it is really critical critical to be um, very good about educating patients not to overwear. Um, I would say that we'll talk about the 10, 12 hour kind of business day and, and then try to get them to take their contact lens out uh, at uh, in the evening time. To, to do that, of course, you have to plan ahead and try to give them something uh, such as, you know, obviously a pair of glasses that they can transfer to. Uh, so they can, you know, function at night. But we really do kind of work at uh, not getting an overwear syndrome and teaching them that this is going to be for a lifetime of wear, and that the cornea will time over and thing. And are there any concerns with a 16 millimeter semi-scleral RGP post graph with limited movement? The lens may not move, but we need to watch for the good tear exchange. I'm not as concerned on a 16 millimeter with tight lids as long as I can paint that lens surface and see the fluorescein get underneath it. Can I rotate the lens? Because um, the larger the lens is, the less I see movement compared to, you know, say a 14 versus as we move up to 18s and 20s. So I think that would be the things I would look for to make sure that I'm getting some tear exchange that I don't have a sealed system. Yeah, now, if I can jump in and say that, you know, I agree, you're not going to see a lot of movement. You really have to kind of just observe the limbus. Uh, let's say you have no movement and you think the lens is tight, but the patient has absolutely no symptoms at all. Um, I don't know that I would play with that lens too much. Um, so. I think clinically you just kind of really watch and see um, what the eye tells you. Definitely. Exactly. Take the lens off, stain it, stain the cornea. Do you yeah. see stain on the limbus? That's right. definitely a big right. telling sign. That's my and main thing is just staying away from the limbus. It needs to be large enough to get away from the limbus and watching that area carefully. Yeah, you definitely have to respect the graft host interface and and make sure that it's protected and ideally if you could vault over it, it's good. And that's another th a topic too is if you're going to be removing sutures, um, you can bypass, you know, refittings if you're already in a scleral lens that's vaulting nicely. Um, you can actually sometimes maintain the same fit um, after sutures have been removed. Even if the cornea bounces forward, as long as there's good clearance, you're actually um, okay with that lens. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, complications of transplants and what we should watch for because there was a question about that um, from the audience as well. well. I'd love to jump in on that if I may. Um, uh, I think there's a spectrum here of mild to severe complications uh, that we need to watch for all of that and we're talking about um, watching the uh, for punctate staining, whether it be centrally or, or at the limbus, uh, all the way to uh, mild uh, breakdown, uh, particularly near the suture line where we most commonly see infectious keratitis develop, um, all the way to vascularization problems with the uh, secondary complications of uh, re corneal rejection. And if I may just make another point about corneal rejection, uh, we really as, as, as fitters need to um, be constantly aware of either a small KP or a little bit of edema and not just ignore it um, because we want to get, if it's going to be a, a rejection, we want to get to it early and the best thing to do is take the lens off for a little bit of time, a couple of days, and see the patient back and, and see if that uh, KP it, it goes away or a uh, small amount of cell and flare goes away or a little bit of edema goes away. So I've seen too many cases where we ignore uh, what we should be looking at in terms of early graft rejection. What an important point. And speaking of graft rejection, um, any comments about steroid use and contact lens wear? Well, I think we have to use steroids, um, you know, particularly if we're fitting patients early on. Um, I don't discontinue steroids. I don't usually discontinue steroids while I have sutures in because I always consider the suture as a potential foreign body. So 
they may be on once a day, they may be on every other day. Secondly, when I am using them with contact lenses, I'm really big about using a combination steroid antibiotic drop. And uh, I must say that I, I do really enjoy using uh, something like Xylet that, that has a combination of tobramycin and lodopredinol. The lodopredinol gives me the steroid effect, but I don't worry quite so much about elevation of intraocular pressures. And while I'm talking about that, if I can make one final pearl, and that is never let a contact lens, never let a patient sit around in your contact lens clinic that may develop a high intraocular pressure. By that I mean is we sit around seeing these patients in contact lenses and manipulating the contact lenses and nobody ever checks their pressure. And if they don't get back to the surgeon where the pressures might be routinely checked, uh, you may be sitting on someone who has a steroid-induced uh, intraocular pressure, for example, or non-steroid-induced intraocular pressure. And I've had one or two patients where they've lost tremendous amount of optic nerve and field while they're sitting around being taken care of for months at a time in the contact lens clinic. So please be careful about that. Excellent point. Very valuable, Pearl, definitely. Um, any other uh, additional um, comments by Dr. Byer or Dr. Reeder? So I think, um, like anything, it's just important to have good follow-up. We want to watch these patients carefully. You know, the contact lens fitter as well as the corneal specialist are seeing the patient at certain intervals, and just keep an eye on things. And you know, the steroid has to be used, but we watch them carefully and educate them on you know things they need to look for and come in right away if they notice anything unusual, um, and go from there. There's uh, so many questions, and if we don't get to your question tonight, we will actually answer your questions via email. Um, but uh, one of the last questions is, can you further explain the reasoning to fitting a corneal RGP scleral? Anyone? <laughs> Oh, you cut out for just a moment. There. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The the question is, can you um, explain the reasoning from fitting a corneal GP prior to a scleral? Well, corneal <laughs> lenses, um, you know, they tend to be. Uh, a little bit easier to fit. They tend to be less expensive for the patient if that's an issue. Um, you get, you know, tear exchange and you don't have to worry about, I think you were talking about it the last um, webinar, uh, removing the lens can create some suction, mm -hmm. which can cut, put the eye at a little bit of risk. Um, so there are a few things that, in my opinion, I feel like a corneal lens is just the safer, easier, better way to go right off the bat. And I would echo very similar comments to that. Yeah, I, I feel corneal lenses are really the safest in, in terms of you're, you're actually getting more oxygen to the cornea because there is the plastic isn't enclosing the whole system. And even a well-fit scleral lens that has tear exchange, if you take a plunger from the center, is going to create suction and could dehiss the, the transplant. And you have to educate your patients very well. So those are just some commentary from, from just uh, experience with some transplanted patients and um, having some setbacks in their care. Um, we are going to... Uh, present this webinar on the website. Um, I'd actually encourage you to visit fitboston.com. It's got a lot of different educational tools and resources for your regular cornea patients. Um, if you go to the eye care professional section, there is educational resources. Um, there's the video series about scleral lenses and evaluating scleral lenses. But there's also the educational guides, which is the guide to scleral lens fitting, the guide to keratoconus and other uh, nice tools that are uh, available on this website, as well as uh, recorded webinars on different topics. I just want to thank you for your attendance. I also want to thank Bausch & Lomb Boston Lab Channel for hosting this webinar. And thank you, Dr. Koffler, Dr. Reeder, and Dr. Beyer for your time and expertise. Have a good evening.